Thank you for joining us. We just uh, finished watching the three films. Um, so folks are just kind of decompressing a little bit from that. Um, but yeah, maybe we could start out just by going around and introducing ourselves. Um, I think Zion, you had a good idea in terms of we could kind of talk about ourselves just a little bit and then maybe how we see ourselves in, in Tabitha's work. Um, and then we'll come back around to Tabitha and then you could give us a little introduction and tell us where, where you're at currently and what's going on. Um, but yeah, I could go first. Um, yeah, my name is Matazi Weathers. I'm currently curator of film over at LACMA, also a filmmaker, farmer, organizer amongst many things. Um, so with Tabitha's work, I mean, it's it's all things that I'm very interested in. And also Nema introduced me to Tabitha's work. So thank you, Nema, for that connect. Um, but yeah, I love all the work, especially for me as a person who kind of started with my art making with film and then coming to farming and really seeing those things as being very connected for myself. Um, so I was very interested in especially some of your newer work that we weren't able to see all of it here, but we have some of it online, um, kind of going into different farming practices, interviews with uh, indigenous folks in the area, um, talking about plant life and love and healing um, and all of that. So I really saw myself there. Oh yeah, and I use they, them pronouns. I can go next. Um, so my name is Nema Givere and I'm a writer, an artist and guerrilla theorist. Um, and guerrilla theory is this framework I've been working within for the past five years that upholds conversation as the highest mode of speculation. So looking towards indigenous modes of knowledge tending and knowledge stewardship. Um, and my work, the, the core of my work is about exploring love and indigeneity in a time of algorithmic debris. But I honestly owe a lot of my curiosities and epiphanies to Tabita and Tabita's work. I remember <laughs> discovering Deep Down Title in 2018, I believe. And I just started this hashtag called Divest from Instagram. And I was like learning about surveillance capitalism. And I was like, oh my goodness, we all have to leave the internet. It is this like hellscape vortex. And I came across your work um, exploring spiritual technologies and these kind of alternate modes of um, relating to technology and it became very foundational to my practice and around the same time I met this brilliant um, West Indian technologist named Olivia Ross and they were the first person to introduce me to the phrase data trauma and the term cyber doula and out of discovering those two phrases I began theorizing around data healing I was like if there's data trauma there must also be data healing and so I think, you know, in my work, I'm interested in applying technology in the most indigenous senses of the word and expanding what we even understand data to mean and look like. And I just was so moved in the screening, seeing this kind of trajectory in each of your pieces. Um, the last one really encompassing these technologies of earth. And yeah, I'm very excited to be in conversation. Thank you, Matazi, for the invitation. I'll go next. Hey, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Zion Estrada. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently on Tongva territory in East LA. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there present. Shout out to everyone. Thank you for coming. I also had a similar entry with Deep Down Title, Nema. So, um, it, 2018 was this interesting time for me in my divinity where I was just starting to tap into uh, the the my family from Guyana. So it, it was an interesting time where I started to like see and identify myself within the Caribbean and within the archipelago uh, diaspora. And someone introduced me to Tabitha's work uh, being in a neighboring country. Uh, my family's from English Guyana and she's from French Guyana. So that there's a small filmmaker world in this part of, of the global consciousness. So it was really beautiful and, and inspiring to, yeah, see the narratives that you were sharing and the aesthetic approaches that you brought to experimental filmmaking. 
I'm I'm entering this space in this conversation also as a postpartum doula, as an educator. I was an educator for between LAUSD and San Bernardino Unified School District for a decade. And um, my training and background lives in palimpsest, film creation, uh, and as I was a trained linguist uh, and worked for housing development. So I think we get to have this really, um, we get to have this really beautiful conversation where I'm excited to be in the presence of everyone, including everyone in the crowd and all of the different perspectives you bring to when you see yourself in this piece to ask some questions around, yeah, how can we work collectively how can we do things that don't necessarily feel different, but feel deeply connected to our spiritual download? Um, so I'm grateful. Thank you, Matazi. Thank you, Nema. Thank you, Tabita. Thank you, Adam. Yes. And then, Tabita, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, my name is Tabita. And um... okay. that's okay. Yeah, I don't know who I am yet, <laughs> but I'm going to find out eventually. Uh, I think, yeah, at the root of what I know or what drives me is that I'm seeking. So I like to say I'm a seeker. I was trying, and every time I have an idea, I think, oh, yeah, maybe it's that. Then, no. So I unpeel and unpeel is kind of... Um, I don't know, shape shift, you know, so now I'm in a transition phase, so I'm unsure, you know, so I guess I had a, I do many things, so, but maybe it's not who I am, it's what I do, so I do film, I uh, serve women, I'm a farmer, I'm trying to be, but I'm being uh, taught the hard way, um, so yeah, I'm just allowing life to humble me more and more and to not know anything basically so i'm a bit in a crisis space of my life so yeah i don't know but i trust that at some point things will fall into place or not who knows but um yeah i'm i'm trust for now mm -hmm. i relate to that i feel like i'm in a crisis space too so <laughs> <laughs> but can we avoid it that's the thing you know because as i mean it seems like the more we think we start to look the more there is to see and the more there is to unsee also so that's the the dilemma you know the unlearning you know that's necessary before we can learn a different way of being of relating of communi communicating of communitying mm -hmm. you know it's like how have we been doing this you know and that's when you get into the, the trauma vortex of life it's a, it's a deep dive mm -hmm. um, yeah anyway sorry that was me that's great thank you um i guess i have a question that could maybe lead us off and then you two if either of you want to kind of dive in as well and then we also want to make space for the audience because I, at least for me, I really like to have screening conversations where it's not kind of, you know, people up on stage are dominating, but also give space for everybody in the room to talk. So I just want to know, too, um, I would like to prioritize folks, you know, of, who have African ancestry or Indigenous ancestry or could kind of connect to some of the wisdom um, that's portrayed in some of Tabitha's work. So I would prioritize that. But if anybody has any kind of comments or questions or thoughts they want to share in conversation, that would be great. Just kind of raise your hand and I'll see if we could fit you in in between the flow of conversation. Um, but yeah, I guess my first question, I'm just curious, a lot of us have connected with your work, it sounds like, through Deep Down Title, um, which at least on the surface seems very different than especially some of the newer works. Um, that we saw, like the last one that we saw is Cacao de Amazoni. Um, so I was just curious how how your own practice has evolved as your interests um, have changed and maybe the conditions and context that you live in or that you're, you're interested in have changed as well. If you could talk a little bit about that. Right, sure. Um, I think a lot of my work at first or still in, in very different ways about this yearning for connection. How do we connect to ourselves, each other, the land, our ancestors? 
our lineage, memory, the great mystery, the whole cosmos, and like how, what intimacy do we have, do we build with the different layers of existence, you know? And before, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, connection. And uh, so, um, and I guess at the time, you know, I was very interested also in like, what technology do we use? You know, what tool do we have at our service? Or how do we connect, you know? And so I guess the internet became a big part of my research and trying to understand that uh, that technology and also like technology in the sense of electronic, you know, and like kind of digital technologies that allow us this sense of communication, but that it's not fulfilling, or at least at the time I didn't feel it was fulfilling and looking at all the violence, how it was, how it came into place, all the power din dynamics and how we reproduce, you know, a lot of the violence that we live in real life in those platforms, you know? Mm. So, and simultaneously, maybe through my own like spiritual journey, practices community, you know, there was those like, practices that you could see as a information and communication technology you know how you relate to your ancestors through divination or through different modes where you receive answers messages you know like literally you could potentially or that's you know uh, outlook compare this to a, a google or whatever you want to know something go ask the ancestors you know and see you know so in a way i guess this interest in technology and my path, you know, personal practice, like I kind of merge and so like, oh, but there's other technologies, you know, that we can connect to or like connecting to water and like uh, the spirits of the, the earth. And so there's other ways, basically, you know, that might be less harmful. In mm, I mean, it depends because, you know, it can also be harmful if it's not used in everything that has power basically can be used to harm or heal or serve or deserve this serve you know depending on who's using it and how we use it and the same with internet in a way or any digital technology you can spread love build community build like beautiful things you know but you can also you know bully harm surveillance all of the racism all the the shit basically so Okay, I'm getting sidetracked, but that was where <laughs> I was at, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work was really about uh, about this and looking at different understanding of technology. So a stone as a technology, you know, like um, plant as a technology, different interface through, through which we can receive information, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I guess, so a lot of those digital works was my way of uh, investigating of researching, of like bringing together like uh, information and sharing what I was uh, deconstructing for myself and cultivating in a way. You know? And now maybe since the last few years, you know, I moved into the forest, you know, starting farming and I need like raw to ground, you know, to something else you know maybe for for my own healing so that transformed me and shifted me so I guess it's about now more putting into practice all the thing I was researching because it's one thing to talk about something and it's another thing to put it into practice you know so I guess that's the main shift what I'm trying to <laughs> and and failing also beautifully but trying again you know with compassion and uh, yeah, to build community, to be with the land and a cycle. And, you know, it's a uh, different work making a film than uh, farming. You know? <laughs> <laughs> different rhythm, different pressures, you know, in different places. But I think so that has transformed in a way my, my work, my aesthetics, you know, because I got tired of being on the screen, on the computer a lot and of the pressure of the a kind of productivist, you know, industry and uh, yeah, I mean, okay, just side note, I think for a lot of time I blamed my miss, um, uh, 
my ex, you know, uh, on the art world or things like this, you know, but but now, you know, that I'm in a completely different environment, I still overwork, I still overcommit, I still <laughs> overdo, I still, you know, so then I was like, whoa, so the problem <laughs> basically, you know, so now I'm also shifting and trying to, okay, how it follows you, you know, even if you try, we've been so conditioned, you know, to, anyway, oh, I have, let me speak for myself, so anyway, so this, this trying to embrace slowness a bit, you know, that shifted maybe the way I work because a lot of my digital work is like over information, over layer, over, you know, and uh, and now maybe it's different pace. So that's my analysis. That's super, I, that's super visible again and in, in like the breadth of your work or even just the three films that we got to watch today yeah the the discursiveness so like so many different references the quotes the mixture between deep archival and then some of the 3d renders or some pulling of lie scans and or just like funny colloquialisms I love when you're you said like pimp my brain like I want to pimp my brain you just jump to like all the ancestors and that type of digital downloading and then cacao de amazonie I, my I have a question of like well how much editing was in that right like how was it was it actually edited or did you just cut and compress down how long did you film your interaction with those folks um because I, I I can speak for myself but maybe some of the other artists and folks in the audience that type of unlearning as an artist or a productivist as someone who's conditioned in the western space we all daydream about let's get a farm with our friends and live in the commune and let's find the place. Let's go back to, you know, let's go back to Ghana, whatever the let's go back is. Let's not even talk about it like, like beer, you know, like there's so much, <laughs> there's so much history and this idea of a going back uh, for folks who experience the, the identify or identify as a diaspora. But um, I'm, I'm really curious, like what was the work for Cacao de yeah. Um, I mean, I want to jump into the going back part of the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for that, uh, basically, it's when I was <laughs> I was in a farming school at the time, and uh, and uh, so I, I'm really into cacao. So I was studying to uh, to learn about cacao, the way you transform, you grow it, you you know. And so that was an internship that I did with a cacao farm in French Guiana. So I stayed for a month or so, a bit more in his farm. And uh, so that was our day to life, basically, you know, taking the canoe, going to the, he has like, basically it's an old cacao farm from um, colonial times. So those old trees, so taking care of them, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that was just my day to day life, you know. So at some point, you know, when we got more comfortable, everybody, you know, had a little intimacy. I was like, oh, yeah, is that okay? I film, you know, some days when we're out there, you know. Uh, and yeah, and I filmed a few times because we were there to work. Now you see them work, but I was also machete. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. And then the editing, um, yeah, I don't know. I yeah, because I didn't film for months, you know, it was a few days, but I guess I always film a lot and then I don't know, I select it. You know how it went, but uh, it was not massive editing like before, you know, like mm -hmm. the film, it's like, it takes me like, I don't know, a long time to edit and it's my worst part also of the whole process. It's like, <gasps> my God, but now it's more... <laughs> For this to work, at least it was more gentle, you know, I think. Yeah, it's so beautiful. In those earlier works, it feels very much so like a transmission. And <laughs> the most recent one feels more like a mode of testimony or a medium of testimony of your own process mm -hmm. and practice. Um, but in both of, in, in all three of them, actually, I've just found myself captivated by the ways that you kind of layered multiple languages 
both linguistic and otherwise. And it was kind of dancing between being very explicit and being encoded. And to me, all three of them felt encrypted in a particular way. And so I'd love to hear more about how you think about and like engage with encryption within your practice, both as like a new media artist and as a farmer. Wow, that's deep. Uh, okay, sorry, my friend. Um, okay, so maybe it has nothing to do with your question, but what comes to mind? So, um, Credo Mutua. So, for those who don't know this person, I encourage you to write it down or check. So, he's an elder, a Sangoma, it's a traditional spiritual uh, healer from South Africa. But he's passed now, a few years ago. And he, one day, okay, so I, I was reading one of his books, you know, and in there he wrote something that since then has. I don't know, it did something to me. He said that many, um, okay, all the negative, uh, pejorative way that the African continent is described, all the nonsense that's been said by ethnologists, anthropologists, all of this, uh, all the misreading, misinterpretation of the cultures, the practices, the language, the ritual, the spirituality, and so forth, the demonization, like, the list goes on forever, you know? He said, like, we've been, I mean, at least from his perspective and area, like, aware, you know, and knowingly never answered or never tried to confront them or to reassess the truth of our cultures, of our rituals, of our, like, it's been, um, basically, he said, like, the silence was a way of protecting our knowledge, our wisdom, our practices, and so, of, you know, he didn't use the word encryption, but you could very much so, like, use it, you know, as a protective shield, you know. And pff, I don't know, like, even now talking about this, I have goosebumps. It might sound very trivial, but I was like, wow, imagine, like, the, the power one must have to allow the whole world, because it's not one person. It's literally a whole, I mean... I don't know, a whole northern hemisphere and beyond who's always devaluating, demonizing, like, you know, a, a whole culture, you know, a whole people and with many cultures and many lands, of course, you know, and still having that deep knowing that it doesn't matter. You can think whatever you think about us, you know, it doesn't, you know, and, affect us or because we stand in our truth in our power and it's better this way mm -hmm. you think what you think because we know our truth needs to be so protective so preserved and transmitted only to those worthy of receiving it you know and wow that really shifted a lot of my I don't know, my understanding and of my anger as well, you know, because I think a lot of my work before, you know, it was out of anger, pure anger, sadness, like, like how I would treat it this way, like why, and trying to prove in a way, like, no, look, there's like technology, there's science, there's knowing, there's wisdom, look, 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 and trying to unearth like different things and maybe to prove to myself as well or whoever you know and 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 heal the the shame in the way of going in the western world who you know and that really was like wow and uh yeah it really i don't know empowered the a part of my of my being you know and maybe i don't know if it was before after i'm not sure but surely it influenced also uh, yeah, my way of investigating, of searching, of sharing. And there is, it might be, it might be unconscious, but now that I'm saying it, maybe it is actually conscious, you know, to say things, but not say there's a lot of symbolic in my work. It's straight up, but there's lots of things that are not so straight up, you know, that can be interpreted in many different ways, you know, according to... I don't know how you, what you want to receive, you know? So, 
Okay, so that was one way of answering, I guess. Or oh, the poetry also is another way, the storytelling. Maybe at heart, I'm a storyteller, you know? And mm-hmm. stories have this very powerful like way of, of being able to be read in so many different ways, you know? Like a story can seem so simple, but then maybe contain like the gem, the secret of the universe. And a lot of, you know, traditional no cultures or spiritualities all all the the knowing the the spiritual teachings are through stories you know so yeah there's something that's uh, precious about uh, about that idea of in- encryption like but then it also has you know consequence mm-hmm. that are not um, small yeah. I see some of this, um, and this is now just me as an observer of some of your films, but I I see this sonically in your work, like when you're talking about this rage and also when you're talking about this 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 need to identify the amount of silence that, let's say, the, the, the white project, that colonial imperial project has, what they believe successfully taken over the world, even though we understand that there's still indigenous knowledge we understand that we still unlock the knowledge within ourselves and our bodies and our dnas we are still surrounded by our ancestors and most importantly there's that equal amount of silence is like the silence that we practice it's our it's our survival technique right it's it's the nod that you might be able to give to one black person around the room that you kind of know what that means it's the references that you have in some of your films that maybe only only certain folks completely understand and then there's that practice of Ifa, which I really appreciated this, this like the sonic understanding of um, there's just some things that should not be told. And there's some things that can only be embodied and experienced. And like that is a survival technology is to kind of keep quiet. Um, but the, the, the sound, again, coming from the first two films, like the sound was so distinct and so constant and so heavy and felt like very meditative and at times like very abrupt. And it would complicate maybe what I was understanding. And then looking at the last film of, with the cacao, that it was just the organic sonic environment, which felt just as, as cacophonous after I watched it the third time. Like it's very loud. It almost felt louder than Orbita. You know, it's like it's so loud and the tapping of the machetes and like the men kind of talking shit in the background, you know, <laughs> just like everything in the locusts who are right there and the trees, like it also just has the same kind of sonic quality. And then the tapping, I, I want, I wish, I want, if you can describe, um, there is a scene, I believe it's in premium content. Was in premium content of the, of the stone circles okay. where the man was tapping, tink, tink, tink. I, I would love to know like what was happening there, but there is, there was a moment where you're describing um, or there was a quote that expressed if you if you don't understand this sonic entrance, then it's not for you. It's it's this like it gives us it gives us a FUBU vibe, you know, for us, by us. This is what it is. But that sonic energy, um, I, I appreciate I see it in your film, but I also appreciate it when it comes to what does that mean for us to tap back in? <laughs> uh, yeah that's uh, simple and so profound and complex you know I guess at the same time I don't know I have a interest in sound but from um, more from physics in a way than from music uh, it's like yeah or maybe the the physicality of vibration you know of what does it mean to what we're composed of, you know, molecules and atoms and how they themselves, electrons, how they vibrate and create and different vibration, creating different shapes, you know. In the film, uh, it's in Orbit Diapason, he said, if you don't understand cymatics, you won't understand the stone circle. And for those not aware, cymatics, it's kind of, um, it's the science of representing sound of how each each sound or frequency vibration has a different shape. And so there's loads of experience. You can Google cymatics on YouTube. It's incredible. Basically, like um, if you take the experiment, a little plate of metal and you throw like sand 
or so, no, salt is too big, but a fine kind of sandy material, and then put a frequency very high pitch, at some point, the sand is going to create a geometry. It's incredible. And you change the sound, it changes the geometry, you know? So it's like each sound literally creates a form. So what does it mean, you know, for all the sounds that are around us, all the sound that we say, the word that we speak to ourselves, to each other, how does it affect our inner geometry, you know, and our, our existence, you know, our relationships, our waters, our everything. So I think sound is yeah, it potentially, I don't know, it might be the basis of existence in a way, you know, and in many cosmology around the world, even in the Bible, first was the word, you know, in uh, in many traditional, you know, uh, in different places, you have sound or sacred the chant or, you know, the songs of creation. It's everywhere, you know, this, the idea that the universe was sung. And so that, and potentially, you know, we're always, I mean, I like thinking about it like way, like that, that we're all like an instrument, you know, and we each have our own like symphony inside our, our bodies or that we emanate different songs. We're just like walking songs and the purpose or maybe one purpose, you know, of life would be to harmonize our song, to tune, you know, like you tune a guitar or instrument. We have to tune our own inner songs to, to sync in the rhythm with the primordial song, the song of creation. And when we tap into that cosmic sound, we are, whew, I don't know, maybe we might dissolve or, <laughs> or maybe that's the, that's the fundamental yearning, this going back, you know, that many Afro-diasporic people or all the dispersed people displaced are yearning to go home. It's like we're all wanting to go home, find home somewhere, you know? But maybe that somewhere is in that song, you know, that rhythm. I don't know. Yes. Okay, you got some snaps over here. I don't know if you could hear them. People were snapping. Um, oh, some clapping. Seriously. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're also, just so you guys know, we're dealing with some sound over here, too. We got a pretty loud buzz frequency that's going on, so it's kind of, uh, I know it's affecting my brain a little bit. Um, but I wanted to open up audience, if anybody at this point had some things they wanted to ask or, or talk about, some feelings that have risen up. Um, oh yeah, we got Colleen over here. Okay. Hey, can you give him the microphone? No, she doesn't want the microphone. She says oh. the significance of the the snake and the silence. Okay, yeah. So she's asking about in the last the last film that we watched, um, the significance of the snake there and the silence. But I guess like that that last shot where we see the what well, looks like a, yeah, it like it was almost dead. Sorry, can you repeat the significance of the snake? Yeah, in the last film, in the last clip of Cacao Damazoni, where the snake was, it, it was a silent scene. And the snake was okay, uh, okay, I'm not sure. I forgot actually about that part. But now, okay, so basically, uh, on that farm, there's a, there was a lot of snakes, you know, the, uh, a kind of snake that is deadly. You know, and so the practice was in that farm. Oh, I hear myself in bubble now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that'll be better. Is it better? Yes. Okay. Uh, no. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So basically, people around on the farm, and I guess yeah, safety practice. You know, to to kill the snake. You know just to feel safe because you you work you know deep in the forest you're trying to also in cacao farm the you have to often take off the little shoots because the tree it always want to have many many grow many many trunks you know so then you have to go at the root and the small one that before they become big you just and that's at the base of the trunk and that's where often snakes are so basically uh, i guess you know throughout the months, many, I assisted in many 
yeah, killings of the snakes, you know, so that was just a, a, a scene of day to day, you know. But uh, it's funny because one day as I was working, there was a snake on my on the, the tree I was working just now. So all the time they gave a signal, ah, okay, snake, you know, and then people gather and I was like, okay, I get, I got it, you know. So they were like, yeah, hey, sure, yeah, yeah, I got it, you know. And then I take because it's easy, it's recommended you don't kill it with the machete because then it can still run, you know, but with a wood stick, you know, and you have to break his uh, spine. Okay. And then I'm like this, you know, but they knew I was all like, oh, love, I was talking to the trees, everything. So they were a bit like, mm, is she going to really do this? You know? <laughs> and then one guy's like, okay, but if you struck, stuck, struck, strikes, you know? I don't know, yeah, you have to do it with the intention to kill. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And he said, saying this, I was like, oh, because it was not at all with that. I was just like, okay, let me try. Mm -hmm. And like he said this, I kind of like, uh, I think I couldn't, couldn't like gather it. And I have special relationship with Snake also. Maybe that's why. Like, so I tried. I missed it. And then we're like, okay. And I'm like, okay, it's still here. Okay. I was like, okay, let me try. I tried again. And then we're like, okay, okay. Give me the thing. And boop, they got it, you know. So maybe I guess it's just that experience that somehow, you know, find its way through 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 the film, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, another one. Yeah. I'm curious about the, uh, the word that you mentioned that represents uh cyanotics. Cymatics. C Y M C Y M A T I C S. Okay, we got a few hands. I saw there's somebody I think up at the top that had their hand up. Do you want a microphone or do you do you want to project? Could you all hear that question or no? I'm, I'm going to try. Yeah, yeah. Can we try it's, doing it with the mic and then maybe you guys can hear? Is that, sorry. Just so they can hear. So we don't have to Thank you. Oh, hey. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I feel like, oh, shit. <laughs> now, we can hear you now. You can hear? Yeah. Okay. I feel like the digital world and mixing it with land work is just an amazing beautiful opportunity to explore queerness and gender identities and sex and sexuality. Um, and you know, doing that in a different culture, in a different space with land work. I'm just curious on how that went for you, especially as like a found presenting person. Um, yeah, I grew up in Indiana, so I know how the farm work and it was so normalized to be a top boy and how to like queer and it was cool. But like very curious on how you navigated all that and what that is of interest in your work, because I feel like um, even just watching your films, it's a very like weird time vibe. I have to get the mic back. So <laughs> <laughs> I think the framing of the question was as you, as the appearance is that you're socialized femme, like how, how are you navigating the work on the land? Like, what does that look like? Is that right? Did I hear that right? Yeah. yeah and what it, thumbs up. Um, I don't know if that's from the film, but all our, the farm we run, it's uh, mostly, I mean, it's only women basically on the farm. So I guess it, I don't know if it, I surely it affects the way we do things, you know, but it's more about, you know, maybe the intention we put, we do ritual before we do everything. We have two sacred trees, you know, we do offerings, flowers, you know, we pour certain, you know, libations. 
there's I don't know different maybe ways of relating to uh, to the earth in the way that we I mean I don't know I think it's beyond gender that also you know it's very much depend on your sensitivity you know but um yeah, it brings a different, we have a medicinal garden for womb health, for medicinal plants, you know, but then we have volunteers that are all on the spectrum, like anywhere, you know, that come work, you know, kids, you know, so it's very diverse in a way, you know, people that come support the community, but on the day-to-day -day life, mostly, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's been mainly, mainly women on the, on the farm, but then, I mean, I don't know if I got completely the question, but if it has a impact maybe on the physical force <laughs> and not to say some have a lot of but we're on a hill you know so on the mountains we have to carry a lot of things when you have to carry soil when you have to carry water because we have no water up there you know wood we built a traditional um i don't know how to translate but let's say a hut you know with palm leaves you know going to forest cutting palm leaf carry you know sometimes we ask for for support you know because it's physically it's very very intense but then again you can be have any type of body and strength you know throughout the spectrum of gender so but uh, yeah i don't know if i answered <laughs> the the question at all yes. mm -hmm. um i think should we go to come here do you have a question yeah yeah you want mike A good question. Hello, um, my name is Kumi. I'm so glad I got to see your work today. I've been following you on Instagram, which probably seems weird because you don't have an Instagram account. I follow the hashtag to be to Rosaire, and that's how I learned that this was happening today, even though I live here and I know these people. But my question is about. I mean, all the films that I saw today were so affecting, and I think it has to do with something that happens when you're translating the representation or representing the organic, organic forms through this technology. Somehow you're transmitting a spiritual thing or reality. Somehow that gets conveyed through. Whether or not that's the technology's real role, you know, or something you're doing through it, um, a channeling, I think that's powerful. Um, my question is, um, or I'm curious about um, organic forms and how you're treating them. Like um, in the second film, I think the second film was, uh, was that worth it? Yeah, it's not. Um, I just noticed like the way you frame people in the frames, right? You're using these like organic forms, non-squares, right? You're not dealing with this kind of non-organic and you you have circles, people in circles, people in leaves, people on bees, like you know, like all this the way that you're approaching layering, I think is really powerful. And I just wonder if you could speak about that framing and layering of organic matter through these digital technological forms. Thank you. Um, just so, did you ask in terms of editing, how I frame people in organic shape or was it symbolic question for how I view in organic people? I don't know, sorry. <laughs> no, <that was> cool. <laughs> or it more like editing? I guess it's yeah, how you're approaching representing the organic through camera. And because like the last film was about this relationship within this cacao field. Um, so how you're filming it and then how you're editing that material in that, or like doesn't have to do with organic or I, organic at all or I, I don't know. I think I don't think too much, you know, sometimes but like in a way my work is really um straightforward in the sense that I share what I experience, what I learn, what I go through, how I evolve. It's like, it's just a, a channel, a way of like, okay, this is what I think, you know, I grasped from life or a question I have, 
and that's the way I've been thinking about it. Here it is, you know, like please think with me, or maybe it might inspire you because it did, you know, it blew my mind and shifted my perspective here. You know, it's like really a, a sharing, you know, not so much as a conceptualizing um how and then my editing process it's very I never know what the film's gonna look like at all. So I have I gather footage for a whole maybe years sometimes it just research. I guess I feel hard drive, I go on site, I feel my go online archive, I talk to people, I, I record, I and when often it's when deadline comes, because otherwise I would go on, oh, that's I love this, you know, to gather stories. And then I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do with this? And like I dump things here, or oh, this make me think of this, let me put this, this, and that, and true, true, and brr. like it's completely like uh, it's like my hands doing it, you know. There's not much thinking <laughs> into it, you know. So, um, so yeah, I never think like, oh yeah, I'm trying to think about the earth, but that is a screen. How am I? No, it's just like, oh wow, I had this amazing experience on this farm, you know. And I know it's so far for a lot of people. I wish they could, you know, hear the trees, see the dense leaves, you know, like just like sweat and like be like, oh my god, I'm. I'm done, I'm tired, you know, just like leave it in a way, or maybe for me it's also a way of, I don't know, encapsulating that moment, who knows, you know, maybe potentially, and then, uh, yes, so, yeah, maybe it's selfish, you know, also, in a way, rather than, uh, I guess, yes, I was like, okay, Um, she put this person in a circle, or she put this person in a leaf. And for you, is that just um, like an organic, not organic, sorry, like a natural impulse? Yeah, I think uh, may, maybe at the time, I mean, surely I put the, there's a beekeeper that speak in the field, you know, she's a, she's, I think it, maybe it wasn't that clear, but she's a beekeeper. So maybe I was like, okay, she's a beekeeper. Let me put her within her people, you know, the bees, like uh, who she relates to. So I put her in bees. Then maybe the circle, I felt like this maybe was a, a community or something. And who knows what I thought at the time, really, I don't even remember. So it's more like at the time what I feel like and then I do. Yes. So it's more symbolic also often, you know? So or association, like ah oh, this makes me sick of this, of you know, like the guy is talking maybe about uh I don't know, uh, an example of, uh, okay, colonialism, invasion, then I'm like, okay, invasion, okay, gold mining, okay, gold mining, cobalt, okay, let me put a phone, you know, inside, let me, you know, I make so many connections and threads, it's like everything in a way, even if it's, it's not that it's, it means something, it's random, but me, I, I kind of can see the thread, you know. I'm I'm saying something also with the choice of not everything, but uh, it's like I make my little story in my mind, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that stands out to me about your films is this kind of, um, and I don't think we've gotten to talk about this yet, but the memification, how you insert these kind of net art aesthetics, which to me feels like a way of adding a dimension of playfulness to what can otherwise be like dense or heavy. And it makes me think also of like a shoe, kind of this trickster energy of like, I'm gonna do something silly and where you're, I'm gonna see where your attention actually goes. Um, and I'm, I, yeah, I'm wondering like to build off of that question, the intentionality behind that. And then kind of a 0.5 addition to that question is, I've noticed this thread of, you know, a lot of the net art artists who came up around like the Facebook heyday have left the internet and either become body workers or farmers. And I'm wondering when you knew it was time to leave the internet. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, the first part was, oh yeah, me. Yeah, 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 okay. That, I don't know. I think I'm funny. 
<laughs> I love that. That's enough. That's all it has to be because they are. She's funny. Saying, it's funny. Uh, yeah, uh, she was like, I think it's funny. Okay. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even I said, I think I'm funny. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think she's funny. <laughs> <laughs> love that i think my humor is not uh, often understood you know uh -huh. and actually it's funny what you say because a lot of time i've been said you know people say or always ask me question yes there's so much irony in your work no, no. and i used to be so offended i was like what irony <laughs> like i really could not uh, receive that uh, description somehow you know mm. and uh I don't know. I think maybe it's because, um, okay, there's this book I really love. It's a bit old fashioned, but I really adore this book. It's called Letter to a Young Poet by uh, Rilke. It's a German uh, poet from back then. I don't forgot the century. Maybe it's not even that old. But... 1919. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful book. And there's an extract in there. So he says something about irony because he's still training, uh, guiding a young poet, you know. And he's like, um, well, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't remember really. But what I remember is that he says, irony is shallow, basically. It's a, it's a shallow thing, you know. Don't get trapped in the shallowness of uh, life in your poetry, you know. Like it's a trap. But if... You go into the depths of existence, in the depths of yourself. From there, your true poetry is going to come out. And if in the depths of it all, still, you find irony, is that irony belongs to you, to your craft, you know? And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I got caught to the first part. So I said, yeah, irony is shallow. And I, it's not something that I related to. I just thought it's humor. You know, I just thought it was very funny. You know, it was not ironic because my work is so serious. Like, I put my heart, like my, it's really like a devotional gesture, you know. So it cannot be ironic. But then it's maybe it's yes, the light hardness. And, and I guess it's also, you know, my, uh, maybe a little less now, but consumption, you know, pop cultures and things. And I mean, even when I found that there's the actual Drake equation, you know, yeah. like, because I'm also a geek, I love science, you know, I can read physics books, things like this, you know, and I was like, whoa, so like, <laughs> straight up my mind was like, oh my God, you know, this scene, you know, it's going to be, <laughs> so I like making, it's like, it's not, uh, again, it's not, um, how can you say, planned, it's like if I, when I'm editing, you know, and the guys, so the scientist who's exploring like inter, in extraterrestrial intelligence, so it's actual scientists, you know, that uh, I got, who said, yeah, no, 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 a diamond, blah, blah. He said that, so in my mind straight up, I'm like, ah, diamond, boop, let's bring in, you know, Rihanna. So it's more like, I don't know, you know. Hyperlink with brain. Basically, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's more like this and then it was so in my memory no, you know, when did you know it was time to leave the uh, interview yeah. okay <laughs> um, so interestingly when I was in the middle of it or even at the beginning you know of my artistic work uh, I was in South Africa and I was with all my friends and okay let's find land, let's build a village, you know, na, 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 let's do this. And I was so like all the time, I was, let's do a village, let's do a village, you know, let's find na, 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 na. Very, very um, engaged, you know. And, uh, but I guess people were not really in the willing or maybe some other dynamics, you know. Uh, so I guess I had this thing in me, but I didn't know what form, how, you know. But then at the same time, so I was living in a house then with my partner. And then when and I was so scared of the garden, I could not go in the garden without shoes on. Like literally, like I used to be very phobic of insects, you know, wow. like like warm things like this I was like no way and when they said yeah I want to take over my uh, mother's farm you know later I was like what a farm but what for like really like I was like <clears throat> far away like I was 
in the concrete disconnection to land like I overcome like poof, so so much so so I had but I was talking about let's get land find a village but then I was like completely in rejection to putting your hands you know mm. into uh, so that grew up uh, well, I'm gonna cut the story short because uh, yeah. uh, but basically little by little you know and then I moved to French Guyana and then it became clear at first I didn't know why I came here really you know I mean maybe you know work out some family lineage trauma like understand better you know some stuff but then you know it's like the forest the forest the forest you know and I was like okay okay I'm gonna do this you know but then about I don't know five years ago I think I found some land beautiful with a river going through it I'm like okay this is it you know and then when it was about to officialize should I should I not I freaked out I panicked I was like no way but what am I gonna do you know how you know and then I guess, you know, the attachment also to my career, to my work, like the validation I was getting from it. Like, what am I going to do in the in farm in the middle of nowhere? So, you know, I realized all my attachment in a way, you know, so I didn't. And then I had to work through all this, you know, until I become comfortable. So like, OK, I don't not that I don't care, but whether I'm an artist, not artist, people, what, whatever I know. This is my calling. I'm going to do this. You know, even if I know nothing about farming, I'm scared of worms. I'm going to do it, you know. <laughs> and then I put myself uh, heads on to the fears. <laughs> I burnt myself to my own fears. <laughs> and yeah, I came out uh, okay. I mean, I don't know. Time will tell, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's beautiful and impressive. You know, I just want to say thank you for sharing the honesty of that journey. You know, and I think um, what I, I have like one last one last thing, one last from me, one last question. That's also for both you and Emma. Um, <clears throat> this idea of like reindigenizing the way that we consume information. Um, I I mean I don't know how many people are gonna be honest or not of like who might have dozed off, who might have like gotten a little sleepy or tired during the screening. Yeah. One person's raising their hands. Shout out. You know, two, two, yeah. There you go. Be honest. But they there's, always do. There's a meditative, I mean, if you go back to like that that feeling of being a little hurt when somebody said some of your work was ironic. And I think that goes back to an, an a very like key part of our indigenous storytelling, the archetype of the trickster, the importance of transmission through happiness, and that importance of the, you know, the different ways that we digest information, there has to be a little bit of that, like honey sweetness. Mm -hmm. So that feels like natural to the way that we tell stories. But it also feels natural, like the temporality, the tone, the slowness, the length, which, you know, when we were posting and sharing, I was like, don't show up thinking you're coming to a Terminator film, you know, like, yeah. get your brain food ready, come prepared to digest some information like this is this is also a re-indigenizing of how we're consuming information as you're talking about sonic configurations, as you're talking about image configurations and ideas and stories. It's reorganizing how we see ourselves. And it's also hopefully reorganizing the way that we want to participate in the world. And I and I guess my my question for both of you as as you both, you know, we all have this different spear spear in the doula world is um it was in premium content when there, there is a statement you said, like, don't forget that the obsession with creating something new killed the first people. And I think as artists, this, there is that similar obsession of like needing to make something new, needing to have something out, needing to publish something, needing to have the next curation, like this idea of needing to create something new is one, was one thing we need to complicate. But the fact that once you create something new, you birth something new, there's a postpartum, there's a grieving, there's like a ripping open. So I'm wondering if y'all have like tangible tools for that type of like data healing and tools and information from some of the indigenous folks that you're working with as you're going to do the practice at Amakaba, which also I would love for you to share a little bit more about that. But I'm right. curious for both of you. Um, it's made me think uh, your story. So um, at Amakaba, we do uh, also this program. But so it's basically we are mainly our activities. It's us the sharing and 
cultivating of the wisdom of the earth, body and sky. And for the sky, we did this thing this year when we went once a month to different village, indigenous, you know, or traditional village and talk to the elders to for storytelling times of stories of creation, stories of the the cosmos, you know. And uh, for one of the events, we went to Kamopi. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, and we invited the shaman uh, te from Teco community to tell us the story of the sun. And mm. then we gather here, but we did this event in collab with a scientific uh, organization. There was a scientist from the observatory of Paris who came, you know, it was kind of uh, in the village. It was, uh, I don't know, a tentative ten attempt, you know, that completely failed. Because when the shaman arrived, you know, after the scientist had made his, you know, PowerPoint presentation, that was amazing, by the way, great, great presentation, so inspiring about the cosmos and things, you know, we were like, oh, but then he starts saying a, a story that has nothing to do with the, star, the sky of the cosmos. And we're like, oh. <laughs> you know, and we were all like a bit like, okay, like, you know, a bit. Of, yeah, embarrassed or not knowing or did we, you know, uh, and then, so we say, we ask, you know, kind of, ah, okay, he's like, no, I can't tell the same story here. Mm. And like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, as organizers of the event, you know, it took like uh, 10 hours of canoe to reach the village, you know, and it's like, okay. And then he said, yeah, it's not the, the right space, you know? Like, I need the whole night to tell that story. Yeah. Like, uh, wow. and I was like, wow, mm -hmm. wow. You know, it's like the space, you know, that kind of projector, presentation, scientist things. Like, it's not, you know, the stories have sacredness, you know? They need to be told in a certain way. So then we went back to his house the next day, and then he told us the story, you know, in a smaller group, you know, I had built a relationship with this person over years, you know, but then I was like, that learning, whoa, it was, it was something. Wow, my heart is actually just beating because that experience sounds so parallel to the first story that came to mind when you asked that question as well. Um, a dear friend of mine, Luma Nascimento, um, who is Afro-Brazilian, we did a voyage, like a three-week voyage from the southern tip of Brazil up to the northern coast and then down the Amazon River, like on this boat. And we met this old man. Um, we were the only like dark-skinned Black people on, on the boat. It's like mainly one that Indigenous people use to like get to the different villages. And so people would be like looking at us and kind of be like, where is this, where are these people from? And they assumed we were from Haiti because there's a lot of Haitians in that part um, of, of Brazil. But this man, he was so old. He looks like a quintessential, like beautiful, wrinkly, like wise, toothless, brilliant person. And he comes up to me and he asked me like, if I'm African and I was like, yeah. And he was like, what language do you speak? And I told him Swahili. And then he asked me to translate five words and they were sun, moon, stars, rainbow. And I'm, well, I, I don't know why I'm forgetting the fifth word. Um, and yeah, from Swahili to Portuguese. And then it's a long story. He ended up like he, he he was like the embodiment of a psychedelic honestly he like took us to the roof of the boat and did this like sun ritual where he was singing to the sun and then similarly he was like I need to take you to the broader ritual he was like will you come to my house in Manaus and you know in retrospect it was a little bit unsafe of us to be doing this but there was just this deep trust that I felt like he had an open-heartedness and like the exchange was not one of like predation on his end or extractiveness on ours. It was this deeply like intimate and reciprocal thing that we were sharing. And so he like wrote his address in my journal. And when we got to Manaus, we went to his home and he had set up this teepee that was like made of weirdly enough, like plastic and wood. And he had these pillars and he had designed his own musical instrument. Um, out of like recycled things. Um, and he lived like in a very modest way. We had we found out that he was actually from a very wealthy family, but he'd given it all up to devote his life to the sun. And he like does these rituals in his front yard for the sun. And it just felt 
like that experience is that trip specifically is where a lot of my theory around re-indigenization came from because it was the pacing of the way that things happened like the how riding a 20-hour bus to get to this place for the boat and then spending like four days traveling a much shorter distance on the boat and then just like following these kinds of threads of connection that I think you know, colonialism and this urgency and pacing of modernity has robbed us of, like understanding how slow and how trust, you know, Adrian Marie Brown says, like moving at the speed of trust. And that is really the pinnacle of re-indigenization and like, yeah, of these kinds of exchanges. I want I want to make one note, both, both of you and your times of storytelling said like, I'm going to make the story short, right? Like both, we, we would do this. How many times do we do this? So I think it's just now that you've opened this up for me. Like when we're, when we're thinking about this pacing and I even like the pacing in the last film where you can tell like the time passed by how many braids yeah. mm -hmm. there or like the change of the water or like one shot, there would be a bush and the other shot, the bush would be gone, right? This idea of, um, yeah, what, what is... What does it actually mean to start putting into practice this idea of re-indigenizing? And maybe it's telling a long ass story. And if people don't have time for it, then maybe we're not, then you just hold and pause and we stay silent. This is where I'll have to come to French Guiana and exchange. That's right. Wrong way <laughs> That's fun. Wow. It was that would be amazing. Well, I was I was gonna wrap it up right then, but since you said we're cutting ourselves short a little bit, maybe too much. I did have one more question uh, yeah. to maybe depart on. Um, I guess I'm just curious with all the talk about, you know, indigeneity, uh, technology, spirituality, um, all these different things, I guess for, for the three of you in this conversation, what what excites you right now about the future or the, the so-called the rest of the 21st century? Like what is something that you are excited about, um, whether you're doing it, somebody else is doing it, or you want to see happen, or it's a dream, or or anything along those lines. Maybe we could kind of close out on that. Reverse! <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? Rebirth. Rebirth, okay. <laughs> Reverse, no, yeah, I guess, for, yeah, I think for me, something very important is how we birth our, our, our babies, you know? like uh, literally because i think if you want a different world like we need to create a generation that's way more evolved than who we are you know and so they need to come through in be welcomed by the earth in a different way and i think the portal of the womb is a portal from which we receive a lot and we both blessings and burdens, you know, but if we do the work and not to put that responsibility only on like womb people, you know, but that the, I don't know, the way we birth needs to be more gentle, more conscious, more powerful, more the way that we can, you know, and to serve that moment, you know, even the how we conceive, how we hold space for those new beings that are going to populate the earth. Yeah, that's something I want to see, you know, before I transition. I, I will, I yeah. mean, hum humbly and honestly say that Amakaba Project is definitely um, something that helps me see the Verizon, right? This, whatever the Verizon is, for me, the Verizon is queerness. For me, the Verizon is indigeneity. For me, the Verizon is just like autonomy, deep connection to spirit. So Amakaba feels it 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 was just placed into my view and it just it yeah. Even the journey, even your journey, right? Like this, it just feels like a true journey of being from an artist and the concrete and the scared of worms to the like going back, going back, whatever this is. The the backness was really just to yourself, is a birthing of yourself. Um I'm super inspired by um, grass workers. Like there are more folks in the Caribbean who are starting to return back to wild grass knowledge. There's a project that my partner and I are working on right now, creative partner, where we're just, yeah, going going through the migration of wild grass and how grass has traveled with us and it's holding sacred knowledge and we braid it and we build with it. We have clothes with it. We, have, we adorn with it. Um, 
So what does that look like to kind of go back to that indigenous knowledge and understand the grass and the roots and the rhizomatic understandings and how that layers into the archipelagic understandings? We're all moving into a tropical future. So what does that look like? And, and how, how do these materials not just be of use for us, but how do we start to like grow and create environments where these materials are, are kin and that we live with them? Um, and then always inspired by Nima's work, you know. So, and Matazi, you know, I, I'm just lucky to be on a call with all four of you. I can only imagine how many amazing people are in this space. Hopefully, everybody gets to share with each other too. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here with y'all. I'm feeling quite um, moved. <laughs> um, to be honest, though, I think the fear for, I mean, the future for me is a place that is laden with fear. And I think that there's, a lot of fear programming and fear trans-induced states around. And so I think the most honest answer I have right now is like, I guess, surrendering to the present moment and trying to understand that within the present moment, the future and the past are like encoded and are coming to life and coming together. Um, and that if I'm here now, I can continue to be here. Like the, these series of moments will tumble into something that will become a life, that will become another life, that will like continue to become life. Even if I can't envision, you know, 50, 70, however many years into the future with necessarily joy, with something other than trepidation, I can be here and believe in here enough to get there somehow. And um, yeah. Well, thank you. What about yours? Are you gonna share yours? Yours. Yeah, please share. Yeah. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, I didn't catch it. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I guess I, I was, I haven't thought <laughs> too deeply about this, but the first thing that came to mind, um, at least I guess for me in terms of filmmaking and everything, uh, something that Colleen Smith who was here had said previously talking about, um, I guess the decolonial modes of filmmaking um, and for me, that's something that's really exciting to see now as a filmmaker, as a film curator, as a film educator too, to see kind of the future of storytelling, of art making, of media making, of cultural production, um, and being able to, yeah, I guess encode that with, with decolonial methods, indigenous practices, and all the exciting ways that kind of film can hold that and potentially push us forward in exciting ways um, and really, yeah, bring some inspiration, some motivation, um, some hype to the, to the future, to future generations and help them, you know, change society, change the world in, in ways that are productive. So I feel, I feel hopeful and excited about that, but also I feel the fear, um, but it's, yeah, it's a big landscape of possibilities. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, thank you all so much for this conversation and everything that was here. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us. We'll be around if people want to mingle and talk. I don't know if Tabita will be around, but um, if somebody wanted to talk, the computer is here. Maybe if she has a few minutes and you wanted to talk to them. But. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Take care.